I'm Richard Crom. I'm the author of the book, The First Minnesota, Second to None, a book about the First Minnesota Regiment in the Civil War. How many generations are you in Minnesota? Been in Minnesota, our family, five generations. Uh, we've been in America since uh, the, the, our, on, on the Bassett side. Came over to America on the ship Fortune one year after the Mayflower. I am the great-grandson of Edward H. Bassett, who served in the 1st Minnesota Regiment during the Civil War. He was a private, a soldier, uh, an infantryman, carrying a rifle, um, like everybody in that regiment was. And uh, in the time that he was in the service, the unit was in the service for three years. Oh, by the way, they were the very first regiment pledged to support President Lincoln when the uh, fall of Fort Sumter occurred. Um, and, and Minnesota didn't even have a regiment at that point, but they formed one in less than 16 days and had the men sent off to Washington City. So how did you go about pulling this book together? What made you decide to write it in the first place? Well, uh, we were doing family history research and it occurred to me I'd really like to try to find the letters that I knew existed that my great-grandfather had written home while he was in, in his 36 months of service. Um, he wrote letters home to his family. I knew they all existed in 1960 and we decided we would try to find them. We didn't know it was going to take nine and a half years. <laughs> nine and a half years? So where did you find these letters? Were they in the trunk? No, they were in the hands of people all over the United States, many of whom we had never heard of, but they were sure tail relatives, and somehow as generations went on, why things were passed on and sometimes parceled out and so on. It took so long because it took a great deal of time to find those letters, but then as we were compiling information, one of the things we had decided is this is a history and it has to be accurate. And so we set a goal that in any single event that we were going to write about, we had to have information from a minimum of four sources from people who had been there and people who had written about it within one year after, uh, the, after the event because time dull, dulls our memories and so a lot of times history gets manipulated and it's not intentional. So when you were writing about Edward, what was it about this story that was different than the many other Civil War books that are out there? We had enough first-hand material from a single soldier in a regiment to be able to relate what the daily life was for, for soldiers. Um, we went to great extremes not to put in every date and every officer's name and cloud the whole issue of the thing by um, burdening you with extraneous information. We wanted you to f see what it was like, live it day by day with a soldier who fought in 34 major battles and 61 lesser fighting engagements in the three years that he was in the service. So give us some examples of some of the things you discovered about daily life for the soldiers that surprised you. Oh, one that really surprised me was the food. They um, were a daily ration was nine uh, hard tack crackers. They're about three inches square and three eighths of an inch thick, and they're so hard you can't bite them with your teeth. They called them, they called them um, worm castles, because <laughs> oftentimes they were shipped in wooden crates, and oftentimes they were full of uh, worms when they came. The men ignored it. They dumped them in their coffee, boiled the worms, and went ahead and <laughs> ate them. But uh, anyway. Uh, what things that really astounded me was how strong those men had to be to endure. And if they weren't strong in the beginning, they became that in short order. The marching for considerable distances day after day in tremendously hot weather and wearing heavy wool uniforms and uh, things of that nature. Are you wearing part of a uniform today? Well, I'm wearing part of a uh, something that resembles a uniform. I'm not wearing an authentic Civil War uniform. They're way too valuable. But I do have a uniform that I had custom made and it's made out of um, wool that was made 
in, in, in a well and mill out east uh, during the Civil War. They were making wool for, for the uniforms, and I have a uniform made from the wool from that from that company. Wow! And so they were wearing those uniforms even in hot marches. Oh yes, a heavy. Well, they'd have a light jacket. Um, Otherwise, when any other weather, they'd be wearing a long, heavy wool jacket that weighs, what, about 12, 14 pounds. Um, I'm wearing a wool vest, and that was also very common. But there's a lighter weight jacket that they mostly wore, um, but they wanted to make sure in the wintertime they had something heavier with them because uh, they didn't have much in the way of shelter. I see you have a clover on there, too. Do you want to tell us about the clover? Well. All the uniforms by all the units in, in the Northern um, Armies, and I say armies because they had more than one, um, when they became standardized, when they first showed up, everybody was wearing any old thing. They couldn't, they couldn't hardly believe it. But when they standardized them, then all the men are wearing the same colors. And uh, if you got separated from your unit in the, in the melee of a battle, how do you find them? How do you get back with them? So then, there was a sergeant came up with an idea of having them make a little medallion or a little symbol for every unit. And uh, the one I have on my hat is, or on my on my vest is is a modern day remake. Okay. But they were never made out of metal at the time. They were made out of cloth, and the men the men stitched them on their uniforms. Well, the trefoil or tree leaf clover, if you will, was the one of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, that uh, my great grandfather's unit was in. So, in total, how many letters did you compile? Two hundred and eighteen letters we accumulated. Actually, after the fact, we found two more. But uh, interestingly, they they were identical to one we already had because he wrote a letter to each of his sisters and to his mother the same day, and they're word for word. <laughs> so in the things that he wrote home, what were a couple of things that really stood out to you in his letters? He was always concerned about how things were going at home. Um, he didn't tell them very much about things about like when they were in battle. You don't write home to mom and scare her to death. Uh, men were pretty tight-lipped about those things, but he always wanted to know how his family was doing and how his friends that he'd left back home and so on. Uh, a very good writer, very observant. His, his letters are interesting. How long did he serve? Three years. Well, that's not quite true. He served for three years, and then after, when they came home, uh, his family was farmers, as were all those people in Minnesota pretty much at the time. And their main crop was wheat. And, well, he was off in the service. It was very hard for his father because he had a younger brother that would help and a little, a very small younger brother that would be helping on the farm. Well, his immediate younger brother ended up signing up and going to the 3rd Minnesota Regiment, and he died in Nashville, Tennessee, of disease. So father is at home trying to raise crops and make enough money to survive. And one of the reasons that he went into the Army in the first place, well, it was the thing to do, and that was very strong in their minds. The other thing, they had been having a drought for four years running, and lost almost all their crops and all the farmers in the area were desperate. Well, he could go in the army and uh, make uh, $11 a month. And that was good pay? Well, not real good pay, but that's what they were paid. Later they would raised it to 13 But in any case, he sent almost every bit of his money home. Talk to me, they're known for their bravery as a unit. Tell me an example of a situation where that played out. Well, we can do two of them, one on top of the other at different times. First one being the very first battle, land battle, of the uh, uh, North American or Yankee armies was at a place uh, called Bull Run. 
uh, Bull Run. In, in the south they call creeks runs. And Bull Run um, was the very first major land battle. Um, they were heavily involved. And most all those regiments had no training at all, didn't know anything. A lot of them didn't even know how to load their guns. Uh, the 1st Minnesota had the good fortune of having been um, trained by um, a retired officer, military officer. And they were also out from the frontiers and they hunted all the time. These guys knew how to handle guns and, and were expert shots. They were. Um, just well into the battle at Bull Run, when everything went to pieces. All these greenhorns from out east that had never even seen a gun before uh, panicked, threw everything on the ground and ran like crazy. They were getting run over by stampeding horses and wagons and everything else. And the only unit that stood their ground and kept the whole army from being uh, surrounded and captured was the 1st Minnesota. They held their ground and protected all the way back to Washington. Uh, they had the largest losses of any unit on the field. They lost 150 men killed on that one day. How big of a unit was the 1st Minnesota when it began? Regiments normally 1,000 men. They varied somewhat. They were one of the only volunteer units that I ever got any replacements and that only happened in two occasions to my knowledge and not in large numbers. But um, how many men did they have at different times? Well, it varies like crazy. Um, but nominally, every company would have 100 men. So you were saying there was another battle that you thought was also a famous part of their history. Do you want to talk about that? Well, everybody knows that the Battle of Gettysburg was one of the uh, biggest and most important battles in the entire Civil War. Now, at this, by this time, they'd been in a lot of battles. I mean, a lot of battles. Um, they had been marching for, for 16 days to get to Gettysburg, and it was tremendously hot weather. Um, they got to Gettysburg, the battle was already on, but it was the first day of the battle and it was just starting to form. So the units were trying to figure out where they should best be placed and all this sort of thing. So the action on the first day was negligible. Uh, the second day they were put in a place uh, to protect the artil artillery unit. The guys on the cannons had no way of defending themselves and if infantry charge them, they, what were they going to do? You know, they were done. So they always had infantry protecting them. The guys were laying there in the heat, in the hot sun most of the days, um, guns firing over their head, but they had a panoramic view of the whole field and they could see what's going on. Um, about Two o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm not certain of that exact time, and I never have seen anybody that is certain of the exact time. But um, out of the on the hillside, uh, half a mile, a little three quarters of a mile across, there's a there's a valley in between. Uh, they um, they saw coming out of the woods over on that hillside, or this this ridge they call it. Um, massive amount of con Confederate soldiers and with numerous cannons uh, with them and they were making a move to come through and break through the Union line. If they had succeeded we would have lost uh, about half of the total strength of armies we had there and uh, the first minute, so the guys could see what was going on and they knew pretty soon we're going to be good at putting into the action. When a young general came riding up on a horse and by the, so they saw him coming and by the time he got there they had already formed in their line of battle and he ordered them to charge that line. Now this is 262 men that were ordered to charge across 400 yards of open ground and stop 1,600 Alabama troops. 
and they all knew this is a suicide charge, our chances of coming back are all on none. They did it anyway. Not one man faltered. They fought him to a standstill and held him until, uh, for about 15 minutes, until another whole division came in, and then they twice refused the order to withdraw. Uh, finally, on the third order, they did. There were 47 of them left. There were some down and wounded that survived it. My great-grandfather was not wounded. He had two bullet holes in his hat, and a bullet had torn away his haversack. That's the bag you carried your food stuff in. A bullet had gone through his blouse on the right side, and a bullet had torn the heel off of his right shoe. I always liked when I'm telling the story, I always like to say, well, it was just another day at the office. So I know when you were gathering the information for this book, you and your wife, you said your wife was a big help, right? Oh, I couldn't have done it without her. Best research person, I think, in the whole world. And boy, the, the trouble with that was <laughs> she could inundate me with the research. But, but because of that, we had a very substantive amount of credible information on which to base our writings. Do you want, and her name was? My wife's name was Sharon Rose. Okay. And when you were doing the research and you found all of the letters, I understand one of the letters came on a special page, a YZ page. Do you want to talk about that? Oh, we had been on one of our many trips east to go explore the battlefields and other pertinent places. And um, we were at Harper's Ferry, which was a major railroad and, and uh, riverboat um, uh, transportation hub. Um, it was also the home of uh, the North's largest arsenal where they built, made guns there. And they had been captured by the, by the Rebs and then recaptured by the Union and so on. But we were there to explore the town and it's really a picturesque place, it's beautiful. Um, in our traversing the streets and so on and going up the incredibly street, <laughs> steep streets up to the top of the bluffs, on the main street, we went into a little, uh, uh, well, it was an office. It was a visitor's center of sorts, not very large. And they had a showcase there, and on top of it, there was a book laid wide open. And what it was was a um, ledger book from a general store from the time of the Civil War. And I asked them if I might look at it, and they said, yes, uh, I could. I think they even gave me the white clothes, so I didn't, you know. But um, I got looking at it because I was really curious. What did people buy and how much did it cost? What did they trade for? And on every page there was a letter, alphabetical. Uh, and that was because if your last name was Brooks, you're going to be on page B. I went through them all, and I got to the very last one. And that had, should have had the letters Y and Z on it because how many people have names starting with those letters. But there wasn't any page. And it was, it just bothered me. Uh, I'm not gonna see the end of the story. And then I got to thinking. I turned to my wife and I said, I've seen that page somewhere. I know I've seen that page. When we got home, we went through my great-grandfather's letters, and there it is, the page. Why? Because it was a blank page and he needed a piece of paper to write a letter home to mom. And he carefully cut it out of that book. Incredible that we ever found that. It is. And so, did you, were you able to give some information back to the... Oh, certainly. We, um, on a subsequent trip, we took to Harper's Ferry copies of the letters that he had written on those pieces of paper. Um, we, we took them archival quality copies of them and also a copy of our book to put in their resources library. So a lot of books have been written about the Civil War. What makes this one different as far as the readability of it? Why would somebody pick this book up? I like to think that the book jacket that our son uh, did just for us as a painting and the picture of the soldier on there is my great-grandfather. Um, 
it's extraordinary extraordinary piece of work. But um, uh, I would hope that because they had a curiosity about the Civil War, we visited Gettysburg, of course, numerous times. Met a number of Gettysburg battlefield guides, licensed, certified guides there. When we had met uh, the senior guide in charge there, he told us that we had written the best book that had ever been written on the first Minnesota. Was it carried out in the Gettysburg store? Uh, yes. So this is a fairly big book. Do the chapters stand alone and what would we expect to see in a chapter? Well, I consider a big book to be like this. <laughs> no, it's, yes. It's a, it's a book of 730 pages of text. Um, it's all in chronological order. Every chapter is another story. So we go from one situation to another. So you can sit down and read one chapter and put it away for the night. You've, you've completed that one. Um, but we also made a very strong effort of making it interesting. We've read hundreds and hundreds of books and some of them uh, you can only digest the names of so many officers and so many dates and pretty soon they overwhelm the story and to us the story comes paramount. Um, so besides seeing the letter that's in each chapter what else would we see in there? Well you may see more than a letter in a chapter because every one of them is in there intact um, and in some places I even uh, copied the um, envelopes so you could see the handwriting of my great-grandfather and how simple it was for him to send a letter. Um, and for three cents. <laughs> so uh, we wrote each chapter to stand on its own. Will, will there be any maps or photos in those chapters? Oh yes, stuff from the period. All of the things we used in that regard are from the period. We wanted you to see what they had to look at, like the officers trying to figure out where they're going to supposed to, where the roads go, where the rivers, and so on. Um, but a lot of that stuff is so aged. We took it into Photoshop and cleaned it up and so forth, so it was at least uh, rendered better in printing, so you could understand it. So, if you had any last thoughts for somebody about why they would want to share this with their family or read it to their grandchildren, what would you say to them? What's the purpose of a book of history like this? It's one of the most important events that has occurred in the history of our country. But I think that the message that we wanted to carry, besides, these were men that put their life on the line knowing very well there was a very, very strong chance they were never coming home. And yet they never flinched. Never turned and ran in the face. Never, in all the battles and fights and things they were in, never one man in the whole regiment ever turned and ran in the face of the enemy. They were stalwart, dedicated, honest men and they loved their country. And we would like to pass that on to everybody. What did you learn from your grandpa that you're applying to yourself, your great-grandpa? You don't give up. My great-grandfather always liked his shoes shined. <laughs> I've had that habit as of, ever since I've been a kid. I, I got to get a kick out of that because when they were on the march and stuff, you couldn't keep your shoes sunny shined, and they didn't have shoe polish like we know it. You blacked your shoes with charcoal left over from a fire and a little bacon grease if you had it. <laughs> but um, I learned uh, how much these men had earned the respect. Uh, just absolutely. He came home from all of this, went to work with his dad, his younger brother George, who died in, in, in uh, the south of disease, died in Tennessee. Uh, he came home and he and his dad put in the biggest crop of wheat they ever had and it just got growing beautiful and everything was going well and the drought hit him again and it destroyed the entire crop. 
and he at that point went and signed up and went back into the into the war uh, in a in the first Minnesota heavy artillery, and he was down in Nashville, Tennessee, in that. Okay. Any last thoughts you'd like to share with the people that are watching this? There are so many interesting stories to be told and to be read. Don't ever think you can't be a part of doing that. You can. Um, and the trouble with history is it's, it's in your blood, and they keep making it. <laughs> so I would say knowing more about the history of our country is worth a great deal to you as a citizen. Thank you very much. <laughs>